I was baptized at 10 and remember making this public confession because in the Baptist church, it's not, there is no infant baptism. So you are baptized only once you have a recognition of yourself as a sinful human being and the need to have Jesus Christ as your personal savior to, to then to wash you of your sins. So at 10 years old, I go down to the front of the church and I say, I'm tired of living as a sinner and I, and I want to give my life to Christ. And of course the church goes up and, and I am baptized as Baptist. So I'm very involved in the church. I start, I become like a youth speaker. I was like a childhood star. But during the same period, I'm a, I get this awareness about my sexuality that kicks in certainly by puberty and early adolescence. Every black home had an Ebony magazine. It was the big, it was the first time we had a magazine that had black people in it. So we were very proud of that magazine. And so my family always got the Ebony magazine. It was, it was huge in those days. And I remember like, you know, turning the pages and, and I remember Richard Roundtree who played his shaft, the whole shaft. And so I remember getting aroused looking at him. And so what I would do, then I would, then there, Jane Kennedy was this model out of Los Angeles. So this black woman, beautiful Jane Kennedy. So then I would turn the pages to try to make me, make myself attracted to her instead of him. So I went through all these just gymnastics of trying, wrestling with sexuality that was clearly condemned by my culture and, and I had internalized it too. I wasn't doing the the black boy things like basketball, but I would prefer to read, uh, which was like for my mother that was a problem. And then I would iron my clothes, and which she felt, I guess, as long as I, she kept me away from the iron, then, then I would be okay. So I needed to do the manly things. And then I remember one day I was sitting on the porch, my mom and sister having a conversation. My mother says, you know, sometimes I wonder if Horace is like that. And they had been talking about homosexuality. And I wonder if I'm the cause of it. And, and I have this like feeling. I began preaching in high school and part of my preaching is against homosexuality. And I remember one persuasive speech I had to give in speech class. And I chose to give a persuasive speech against homosexuality, to persuade everyone that homosexuality was wrong. And I used Anita Bryant as my reference. I'm wanting to go to Morehouse, which is all male, where Martin Luther King went. So it's an all male college, so my mother is very opposed for that reason. And I say to her, and still struggling within and not sharing any of what's going on inside, but knowing she knows, well, feeling like she might know but I have to be very defensive and I have to prove that I'm not because I was out to prove to everyone that they were wrong and that I was going to get married to this young woman I was dating in high school and she was gonna be the preacher's wife and everything's gonna be fine. So I remember telling my mother that, my mother was talking about the number of gays who were gonna be at Morehouse. And I say, well, you know, if they will be with their kind and if they come up to me, I'll just let them know that I'm not interested, something of that sort. And so I went, I went, I went to Morehouse and uh, she was right. <laughs> there are a lot of gays at Morehouse. And I was my first year, actually, the guy next door to me uh, uh, came on to me. And, and I was like amazed. I mean, I'm coming from this small town where you, no one would identify as being gay. Uh, I mean, he wouldn't even bring up the topic, let alone identify. I tried to get upset, and I knew I, was, I knew I was supposed to get upset, but I was intrigued. But of course I, no. And, and then I started my campaign at Morehouse against homosexuality. <laughs> so I, there was one guy from New York who was very visibly, in, in a stereotypical way, of being gay. And so one night I take my Bible, and I go up to his room, he was on the next floor on the dormitory, and I go to his room, I knock on his door, and, I, and, and he invites me in, and I say, um, so we talk a little bit, and I say, 
well, I understand that you're gay. Uh, you're homosexual, probably was the term I used. And his response surprised me. He said, oh yeah, I am. He said, oh, I've always known. He said, when I was a little boy, I preferred pink over blue. And he was just so cool about it. And it just really, I didn't know how to come back because I assumed he was going to be, oh yeah, brother, save me, you know, pray with me. Because I was prepared to pray with him and deliver him from his homosexuality. And so I kind of left confused that I was really in a different world. And, but I continued my campaign against homosexuality. So I preached sermons in the college chapel against homosexuality. I wrote letters in the school newspaper, uh, college newspaper against homosexuality. And some of the professors felt, in fact, some of the gay professors had commented that I was crying out, that I was actually fighting because it's like, why is he on this all the time? And, but none of them, they were all closeted and none of them talked with me about it. And then I graduate, and then I meet a man the summer after I graduate on the campus of the Atlanta University Center. He was an older Morehouse man, and so he hits on me, and cause he said, how is Morehouse these days? So, you know, I'm really attracted, but when I would be attracted to guys, I would just say, oh, you know, nice guy, you know, kind of hang out with him. So we talk after I was in the dining hall, so it was dinner. So after dinner we talk, I go over to his apartment and um, one thing led to another and we actually have sex. I shared my body with him. And it was, it was both wonderful and disturbing at the same time. And Afterwards, I was a wreck. And actually, I probably was suicidal at that point. But fortunately, he was older, he was mature, I started crying, and I, mean, I, I felt like all those guys that I had written about, I had preached about, I was one of them. So it all came down on me. And I just, I just felt, oh God, what do I do? Because I had fought this all my life. So he says something just before I go to Boston University because I went to Boston University for seminary that August, that following August. So we have this wonderful four days together. And the, way, the only way I could bring some peace to that situation was to put it in the context of Jesus. So I felt like Jesus had come down to visit me because it was... It was such a wonderful, it was an experience beyond what I thought I could experience here on earth. So, but it, so it had to be spiritual. So I think a couple things that helped me, that eased the guilt, but it also put it in a context of, of I found, I connected with, with, with what made me whole. And he said, Horace, we believe this because we were taught it. And that was the first time I ever heard anyone say, and that's not radical, but every, the first time I heard someone even say something that countered homosexuality as an abomination. And I always thought it was like self-evident, like this is, a, this is a desk. That everyone, oh, homosexuality is wrong, clearly. It's like, that's a desk. Until he said it and thought, well, everybody doesn't think that. So I go to seminary and seminary, begins to expose me to how the Bible's been used. So I get biblical criticism, historical criticism. So I begin to make the connection, slavery as an African-American, the Bible was used to enslave us. And I was able to, and then I had heard how women were subjugated by scripture. And I thought, oh, well, they're doing it here the same way. So I made those connections. But you know, one thing intellectually, but still emotionally, I mean, there are two different things. You can intellectually feel one way, but still not resolve it emotionally. And so emotionally, I, I went through years of just struggling with it. So much so that I had to take a leave of absence from Boston University because I was still just so, I would see now depressed. Clearly at this point, I'm different. I've gone through the period of difference. I am gay. I recognize that. So what am I going to do with it is now my quandary. Where can I go with this? Who can I, who can I talk to? 
And in the Baptist church, I'm still Baptist, Baptist minister, no one will accept this. I don't want to live my life where I'm going to be condemned the rest of my life. So I'm going through all of this very, very low period. And one day I'm driving in my Volkswagen Golf um, and I'm on Interstate 75 North, Atlanta. And as I'm driving and it, was, it had begun to rain, so it's overcast, rainy, and there is a truck driving across the interstate. And I'm driving in my Volkswagen Golf, so I hit this construction truck with my Volkswagen Golf. And the impact is so great, it turns the truck around. So my car goes in like an accordion. I get out of the car, and I have a couple of scratches here and in my pelvic area. And I am okay. The Spirit spoke to me. Is this what you want? And it was coming that close to death that I said, no, I do not want to die. I'm too young to die. I want to make a contribution to life. And at that point, I decided I would never let anyone make me feel less than human again because I was gay. And in 86, and that was my uh, turning point, excuse the pun. <laughs> I left the church. I was angry with the church. I felt like it was crazy for me to keep going to the church. I felt like it, the battered wife. I felt like, this is crazy. Why am I going to an institution that beating me up over the head and saying that I'm not good enough? That is unhealthy. So I was out of church for about 10 years where I didn't go to church. I was angry with the church. I've, I was a, re, a religious studies professor at that point. And I said, well, my college students will be my congregation. And it'll be like John Wesley. The world is my parish. And I, I won't have anything else to do with the institutional church. I'm in a relationship at this point with uh, a man who I met at Vanderbilt, who is, uh, is, was in the PhD program in Hebrew Bible. Ken and I had gone through this three year long distance relationship and we really wanted to be in the same city. It was really very challenging on the relationship. So he's in Chicago, so the chances that I would be able to find a job in Chicago rather than he in Columbia were more, much more likely. So I did get a job at an Episcopal seminary. The first year I taught on the faculty, at the end of the school year, the spring of 2000, I became confirmed in the Episcopal Church and was ordained to the Episcopal priesthood in 2005. I realized because I live in this country, it has a lot to do that with the reason that I'm a Christian. If I were living in Bangladesh, I probably wouldn't be Christian. Or if I were living in uh, Indonesia, I probably would be Muslim. So I recognize that it's, a, it's a, the part of the circumstances in which I find myself that I am Christian. So that tradition has worked for me, and Jesus works in that way. But I wouldn't see Christianity as the only religion, uh, the only way, because I'm not a fundamentalist and is one of a number of ways to get to the divinity of God. But I do believe that Jesus lived a good life, a life of a sacrificial life, a life he gave his life for a better world. And in that act of for, for what he stood for, that he would be crucified in that way was an act of redemption for a better world in a similar way as Martin King. So I would see Jesus as one, uh, Mahatma Gandhi would be another. Those who've given their lives to make a better world, for a transformation, for a redemption of humankind, I would see them in a similar role. Unfortunately, when we look at all the wars that have been fought, all the people who've been killed, all the people who've been enslaved because of religion, then the practice of religion has been a very, very bad thing, very deadly thing. The social systems we have that make us do terrible things, the teachings that we pass on, all those things, if we start correcting that, which is connected to how people think, but that, that transformation, when that's transformed, and I see Jesus giving his life for that. It's very interesting how homosexuality is focused on today, which I say is again a misuse of scripture that Jesus never said anything about homosexual activity. 
but he had a lot to say about people who were, well, rich. My struggle with uh, capitalism is that it does value people based on income and how much money they have, and they're given privilege over others. And if we really, we've gotten to the point in our society where we have said that it's not okay to treat certain, some people better be, uh, over others because of, of skin color, for example, or gender. And even we're getting to that point on sexual orientation. But we don't seem to make that same connection on income, on wealth. And so I, my question would be, if it's not okay to value certain people or privilege certain people because of skin color, why is it okay to do it based on wealth? I don't believe in this end time of Jesus' second coming, which again elevates Christianity over other religions. So I don't believe in that. To me, that's Christian supremacy. The book of Revelation is a book that is written in a lot of metaphor, metaphorical language. It's, it's an interesting piece of writing, similar to some of the sci-fi work that's out there. And people read it literally. I don't read it literally. So I don't think that all of these monsters and beasts and uh, explosions and all those things, I don't think that is what's going to happen. As human beings, I feel like we can do wonderful things. When I think about so many wonderful things that are being done, and, and, and our, because of what the, the ability we've been, the minds we've been given, when you think about what we can do with defying gravity, flights that take off, which is why I think if we put more time, energy, our energy, our, our, our ment mental ability, our physical ability into doing good, into really spending time how we can be better as opposed to spending time in war or fighting each other or focusing on things that are so irrelevant as whether someone sleeps with a man or a woman. It excites me when I think about when we really connect with people and we, we're together and what we're doing now and how I connect with other human beings and how we love each other and the beauty, the power that comes with that love. And that can just spur us to do amazing things, just things that greater than we can imagine. <laughs>